with that said, I think we are all set and ready. So thank you all very much for calling in. Um, today we have an unusual Einstein toolkit call in the sense that we um, are taking up and picking up our tradition of having presentations once more. Um, today's presentation is by uh, Gabriel Bozola, um, who will talk about Quibit, if I pronounce this correctly, um, which is a post processing and analysis tool for the Einstein toolkit written in Python. And with that, um, please do take it away. Um, I assume that if you have any questions, uh, you should probably just interrupt um, as you would normally do in a physics talk. Okay. Hello and good morning. I am very excited to tell you about this project I've been working on for a little while. I, I myself don't know exactly how to pronounce this word, Quibit. Uh, that's how I pronounce it. And I'll tell you later what it means. Uh, I want to keep it for the end. So this is a Python project for post-processing your simulations. And the goal of my talk would be to tell you what I mean with community-friendly, why I chose this tool and why this uh, qualifier community-friendly makes this uh, tool special. So my name is Gabriel, if you want an English pronunciation or Gabriele, if you want an Italian one. And as Roland said, feel free to interrupt me anytime for questions. I prepared this talk to be, I don't know, about 40 minutes, so that there's plenty of time for questions. So again, feel free to interrupt me. Uh, what I think I'm going to, well, what I'm going to do is uh, this talk will be divided in two sections. In the first section, I'm going to go over a uh, general overview of the project itself, not even the code, just like the features of the project. And in the second part, I'm going to uh, show you like some general capabilities of the code, and I'm going to show you some uh, things that I think you should be aware of if you want to use this code. Uh, however, the second part of the talk will not be a tutorial. Uh, I will not go into details, but I hope I will give you enough information so that you can fill the gaps yourself using the documentation. Um, I think I hear uh, Roland uh, beeping every time there's some new connection. So I don't know if you can uh, mute yourself or uh, disable the bell. Uh, it's not me beeping. The bell is, ah. print, is, uh, is coming from Zoom, and the host ah. has to disable it, which I'm not. Ah, okay, I'm sorry. Well, uh, yeah. Yeah, so in the second part of the talk, uh, it, it will not be a tutorial, uh, so it will not be comprehensive. Uh, but I, I want to stress some things, and we'll see later. In the second part of the, the talk, I will go over some examples. So uh, in the second part, if you have questions, maybe wait for the example because I'm sure the examples will clarify what I'm what I'm explaining. So with that, we can get started, and we start with a uh, again overview. And I want to start uh, giving a extremely high level overview so that we are on the same page. You know what I'm talking about. So Quibit is a Python 3.6 or later library for uh, quantitative post processing of simulations. So it's not like just visualization. This is for actually crunching numbers. And at the first order, Quibit is a re-implementation of uh, Wolfgang Kastan's post cactus. What it means is that the general design of Quibit is pretty, mu pretty, pretty much the same as uh, Wolfgang Kastan's post cactus. So if, you're, if you use the code, you'll find yourself uh, in a familiar place using Quibit. Um, an implementation in some sections is, is similar, in our sections is completely different. Uh, and Quibit supports uh, a lot of stuff. And primarily it's what I'm listening here, that is uh, grid data, any kind of grid data. So one, two, three D, HD5, ASCII files, and uh, time and frequency series. For example, what you can output with uh, carpet ASCII. So for example, you output the maximum density as a, during the simulation and you can, you can use this and you can work with this. And, and then there's a, a support for gravitational waves. So extracting gravitational waves uh, from Cypher, computing stuff with gravitational waves, so energy, angular momenta, or other useful quantities that you may be interested in. And also in general working with gravitational waves. So for example, uh, Qubit has all the data for uh, detector sensitivity curves for known detectors, well, all the data. Some detectors, for example, LIGO, LISA, uh, Cosmic Explorer, all this kind of stuff. And uh, there's also a module for uni doing unit conversion, for example, if you want to do geometrized to physical. And there's support for horizons uh, with apparent horizon finder, as well as with uh, quasi-local measure. And 
what I mean with support here is that Quibit, when you, you work with this stuff, Quibit is taking care of all the low level details for you. And this is a critical point. And this is one of the benefits of using Quibit is that Quibit hides all the technicalities from you. And I'm going to hammer on this point. I think this is very important. So I want to give you an example of what I mean with this. And I want to give you an example of how uh, you will go about and work with uh, Quibit. So, so here I'm going to give you one of these examples and I will not go into detail. I just want to give you a sense of what it, what it is uh, to work with, uh, with Quibit. So this is the problem. I think it's a fairly common problem. That is, you, you run a big simulation, maybe it took uh, five months. You run a supercomputer, uh, a lot of simulation restarts, a lot of checkpoints, a lot of MPI processes, um, and you have all this output. And now you realize that you want to compute something that you didn't compute during simulation. You want to, in this example, you want to find the viol maximum violation of this quantity, which I made up. So you have a, you have a quantity, V, and you want to compute something with that quantity. Uh, this is, I think it's very common that you output something and you want to compute something out with it. And, and you want to compute this violation as a function of iteration. Now, if you think about this for one second, you'll realize that this is not a completely trivial problem. There's a lot of stuff that you have to take care of. So first of all, this is a big simulation. So you have multiple checkpoints, simulation restarts, and you have to be able to, given an iteration, find the files which are associated to the iteration. So you have somehow to organize your folders and understand where different uh, iterations live. And then maybe you have duplicates because maybe you uh, repeated, like you simulated twice the same uh, section because you want to change some parameters or because there's some misalignment between checkpoints and uh, 3D output. And so you have to be able to only keep one of the duplicates and you have to be, uh, you don't want to do this manually, you would like to automate it. Um, then once you uh, somehow find, uh, you, you found all the files associated to the specific iteration for the variables you are asking, you have to read the HD5 files. And this, uh, if you've never seen an HD5 file can, can be complicated. It's not just, you cannot double click and open and see it. Uh, you have to use proper tools to read the HD5 files. And once you read the HD5 files, if you want to plot this, then you have to reassemble the grid. You have all these MPI processes. So you have all these different section of the grid and you have to put them together. And this is not like easy to do especially if you want to be mindful of the gosons, especially if you want to also read what's the goson information for the, from the files themselves instead of specifying manually. So once you've done that, you have to represent this data uh, and you can naively use, a, a, for example, here we're talking about Python, so you can use a NumPy array, uh, but this by itself cannot be the best representation because the, an array completely ignores all the information about the grid. There's no association between data and grid. So um, you have to be careful about working with your arrays because you have to make sure that the different points are, are lining up. They, they match when you combine multiple arrays. And in this example, I also put a coordinate. And this X here represents the, 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 the first coordinate. And again, working with this is not completely simple because if you're thinking about, you have an adaptive mesh refinement, which is uh, commonly the case when you work with these big simulations, the coordinate change with time in the sense that you have resolution, maybe you're, you're tracking two black holes and the coordinate change with, with time. So you have to extract the coordinate at each iteration as well. So all of this, I mean, it's perfectly doable, of course, but it's not straightforward. I think there's a lot that goes into, oh, I want to check this. And then it, there's like hundreds of lines of code to, to check this. Um, and this, again, will be a recurring theme for, for using Cribit, at least, is that I think there's a lot of friction between uh, um, running a simulation and looking at the output. OK, now that I, that I set up the problem, and I think you can maybe sympathize with, the, with this problem uh, because I think it's fairly common, let's see how you would solve it with Cribit. So this is the solution. Here I'm defining a Python function that takes two arguments. 
one is the is the is where your data lives regardless of your uh, simulation structure your output uh, structure and the second argument is the duration and i'm not going to explain this uh, here what i want to just mention is that in the first two lines what i do is i read the data so i take care of all the low level details that i discussed before so finding files iteration and removing duplicates uh, within files all this stuff is taken care in these two two first two lines then the other lines i think are i think are reasonably clear so what i do is i compute the laplacian which is this first object here by taking well here is this vx so i take my first uh, element i take the gradient with second derivatives so it's dx squared plus the uh, dy squared and dz squared and then i sum sum these three um, same with similarly with divergence uh, this is di di, and then I compute this equation. So Laplacian bx blah blah blah. And in doing this, I'm also extracting the coordinates. Uh, and this is done for each iteration. So essentially, what I'm doing is after these two first two lines in which I read the data, I'm spelling out this equation in a clear way. At least I think that's the case. Uh, and then, and this specific uh, problem, what I want to do is I want to compute the maximum violation of this quantity. So I can just use the uh, method uh, absolute maximum to get the maximum violation. But it will be easy to, to plot uh, this if you want. And the interesting and most important aspect of, of this is that this function I wrote, I can give it to you, you can use it. This is completely general. It doesn't assume anything about your data. It doesn't assume anything about how you uh, output, how you, how you structure. It supports different kind of, uh, if you output with one grid, uh, one grid function per file, one group per file, everything is supported. So you can just use it. And it's a, it's a lot of uh, code that you don't have to write. Okay, now that this is, uh, we are on the same page, I think. Now that you know more or less what I'm talking about, so what I mean with quantitative post-processing of your data, um, I want to, to tell you what makes Qubit special and what I mean with community friendly. So since the beginning, Qubit was uh, built with the idea that I want other people to use it. Other people could just be uh, my group mates or anyone in the community. Uh, but since I wanted this, I, I set for myself specific goals. And the goals were different for different parts of the community. So in this slide, I'm going to go over the different members of the community and going to tell you uh, what were my goals for these different groups. And again, I, I want to stress this because I think this is uh, what makes this code special or this project special. So of course, a big uh, part of the community is the users. So users are those that uh, run simulations and want to look at the data, look at what's, what's happening in the simulation. And everyone is also a user, I, I assume. You, you're using the instant toolkit because you want to get something out of it. So my goals for, for the users is, first of all, I want, I want to create it to be friendly to newcomers. I, I remember when I started using the instant toolkit, the tools I was given were Xcraft and Visit, which I don't think uh, can get you very far. Um, so at the time I was learning numerical relativity, I was learning how to work on supercomputers, I was learning how to use the instant toolkit. It's a, it's a big cognitive load. So I wanted to make sure that if when someone is starting to use the instant toolkit or this tool itself, it's, it's easy to do or reasonably easy to do. For example, this means easy to install, easy documentation, well, documentation uh, examples, all this kind of stuff. Um, Second, what I wanted to make sure is that uh, this code has to be uh, completely workflow agnostic. Uh, some people like to work with Jupyter notebooks, other people like to work with uh, scripts, other people like to work with interactive uh, sessions. This code should work for all of them. And moreover, uh, in general, what I wanted to do is I wanted to hide as much technical detail as possible, uh, exactly like the answer to it does in. Uh, you, know, you don't have to take care of MPI parallelization in the low-level detail. I want you to do the same with the post-processing. Uh, I want you to take care of uh, reading HD5 files. Okay. 
it shouldn't be your main problem when you're uh, analyzing data or it shouldn't be an obstacle. And with this, I wanted to one, uh, lower the entry barrier in using the Einstein toolkit because at least you can run a simulation and see what's going on uh, easily. And second, I think, you know, there's so much more to, you know, running a simulation is not doing science. Uh, there's so much more to that. Especially if you run a big simulation and you're left with a petabyte of data and you don't know what's inside, that's, it's a little bit, you know, unsatisfying. So I want to creep it to uh, re reduce as much possible as possible friction so that you run a simulation and you can look at the science without thinking about all the details. Uh, you have an idea, you want to check the idea. Uh, so these were my goals for, for users, but users are not the only, um, you know, part of the community, there's, there's more to that. Uh, second, we have the developers. Developers can be developers for Einstein Toolkit, for Ernst or Quibit itself. And, you know, Quibit doesn't do everything. Uh, there's a lot of stuff that's not, not supported yet. So if you want to use it and you need for something that is not there, you have to extend it yourself. Uh, so I want to make sure that developers can extend Quibit. And so for this, uh, Quibit has a very modular approach and there's a bunch of modules and it's a, uh, it's a well commented code. We'll see later an example. I try to be overly verbose. For example, in naming variables, I, it's a super annoying uh, like style I have to have very long variable names. It's, it hurts your finger to type them. But at least when you jump into the code uh, and you've never seen anything else, you, you can get a sense of what's going on just for reading all the different variables. Um, and then uh, for developers, I want to make sure that this code is completely openly developed. It's not that I'm working then every month I upload what I have. Every, every everything I have is on GitHub. Uh, every update is there and we can work together if you want to, to implement something. I'm very happy to accept contributions and I'm very happy to, in general, uh, support this uh, effort of developing extending Quibit. So if you, if you go in the repo, you see what I'm doing. And again, we can work together to, to improve it. Um, next uh, is an open neglected uh, group in this in communities, which are the maintainers. In this case, maintainers of Quibit is, is just myself. But you know, it will be very it will be a waste if after all this effort tomorrow I decide that I don't want to use the instant token anymore. This code just dies. So I wanted to make sure that this code is one not a big burden on myself and two. Uh, I want to make sure that other people can help maintaining uh, in the future in case I, I, I will stop maintaining or if they want to help me because they, they transition from developers to, to maintainers. Uh, and so if, so for this, what I, what I did was, for example, to uh, implement technical uh, details or, uh, for example, I don't know, continuous integration tests or I am completely compliant with the latest and therefore uh, the Python packaging uh, authority. Uh, so technically, this project is uh, uh, it, it is set up in such a way that, in theory, it should be less of a burden to to maintain. Um, okay, now that you 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 know what are my goals for different uh, groups of in, in communities, in this community, let me tell you how I I try to achieve these goals. But let me tell you some of the features of the project. Again, I'm not talking about the code. I want to tell you about what's, ar what's around the code because I think that's very important. And so uh, Quibit has uh, documentation that you can find online. It's, there's documentation on like how to use stuff, but also there's technical documentation. So you're, you see a reference material. So you can see each like essentially APIs. You can see the signature of the functions, what they take, what they expect, what they return, but also like in general how to use this code. Uh, we have uh, tutorials. Uh, these are reasonably simple. No, they're a simple tutorial that explore the, the basic uh, features on how to use uh, Quibit. Uh, so as you see, we're, we're working with uh, time series, frequency series, and unit conversion. So you can read the tutorial and uh, get a primer on how to use the, this code, or at least the basic features. Then we have uh, real world examples. With this, what I mean is that 
I said, I, I, I upload everything I have on GitHub because why not? And so I'm right now I'm writing code for myself. So might as well share it so people can have a look and learn from it. So for example, in this case, I don't remember what I do. Uh, oh yeah, I plot uh, say, say four. Um, so these are real world examples. I'm using, I'm writing this for, for my own research. And or you can use them directly or you can learn from them. Um, then we have comments. Uh, so for example, here I have a regular expression. And if you're not very familiar with regular expressions, what I'm doing here is I'm explaining the regular expression. So the different capturing groups. And I'm giving you an example of what this is supposed to match. So for example, hydrobase press max, maximum uh, ASCII file. And so this is not just gibberish. You can immediately, even if, if you're not familiar with regular expression, you, you know what's going on here. Um, then there are tests for, for the entire code base. And there are, there's continuous integration which means that every time I push a commit, all the test switch is run. So if, if I introduce a regression, I, in theory, I should catch it. As you see, this is not perfect because sometimes our, the tests then feel, then feel they, they feel themselves. So the problem is not the code, but in, in the test, like it was in this case. Uh, finally, I have, uh, so Quibit is built with uh, modern tools. Since it was built from scratch, I could just uh, start with the leader standards for, for everything. And which means that, for example, all the problem of handling dependencies is completely solved. And it is absolutely trivial for me to uh, publish this to PyPy so that you can trivially install it with pip install quibit, pip3 install quibit. Um, so I think, yeah, so I think this was my uh, general review of the project. So I think this is a good uh, point where to take a break to, to get questions if anyone has questions. Yeah, this is Bill. I don't know if we're going to raise hands or not, but uh, anyway, so a uh, great looking tool so far, but uh, can this work on non any HDFS5 files that I have going on, or is it really focused on sort of grids and whatnot in Einstein Toolkit? Uh, so this is most definitely geared towards Einstein Toolkit. Okay. Uh, and most of the benefits are exactly because uh, essentially I scan the content of the HDFS file so I can understand what's what's inside. And this is based on the fact that I know what's more or less the format in which the answer to get writes stuff. So I think while some features are, you know, general, uh, I think especially working with HDF files is uh, will be cactus based. It doesn't have to be answer to get, but it has to be cactus based. Okay, and, and you're probably about to answer this, but do I have to give it access, like aim it at my simulation directory with all the files and whatnot? Uh, well, yeah, I mean, you have okay. to, yes. I couldn't take out the data files and expect it to do something useful. Like if you, I mean, if you just want to work with a specific, I don't know, you would just want to work with, with gravitational, uh, uh, gravitational waves, you That's just take the files. Yeah, yeah they, they have to do with gravitational waves and uh, work with that. And in fact, that can be useful because uh, since this package is doing a lot of stuff, it means that sometimes it's processed much more than it has to. So if you have to work on it with uh, gravitational waves, just take take out the files that you need to put them in a separate folder and work with them. So okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. More questions? Yeah. So um, how long do you envision you yourself uh, will be supporting this tool? Uh, I, for as long as you use the instant toolkit. So, okay. Uh, so which well, there are multiple ways in which I can stop using the instant toolkit. One can be I switch to a to a better tool, or I, I leave the field. I, I'm not like in my future. I don't see any like in near future at least. I don't see any of these two happening. Uh, right. But uh, like of course, I'm writing this code for myself. Right. As a as a first user. So as long as I use it, I'm going to support it. So I, I guess one of the things I'm thinking of is we're in the process of uh, transitioning um, carpet to carpet X. We want to base things on Amrex. And I think this will probably result in some differences in the format of output files. Perhaps Roland can comment on that. Uh, and it would be nice to see this, uh, to see Quibit 
um, functioning with, with what we come up with next. And mm -hmm. it would be difficult uh, to make those changes without, without you involved. Um, the other thing I'm, I'm wondering is, do you envision this as officially becoming part of the Einstein toolkit? Yes, that's uh, that will be my last point in this presentation. I think this package should be part of the Einstein toolkit, uh, but it's it's not up to me to to decide if this is, you know. It sure, no, it, it's but... the community that has to decide that. But I, I I imagine that we'll want it. Yeah, I you'll see it, my last slide. I I will ask you what's your opinion. I think this package should be included in the Einstein toolkit. Uh, Okay, just to wedge in a comment uh, and to make sure that we don't lose you. So if there are any shortcomings in the Einstein toolkit, if there's anything that we can do to make sure you continue to use it, please be vocal on the mailing list. As long as we keep you in the community, we will benefit from you. So please speak up if there's a bottleneck. Oh. So I was <clears throat> wondering, uh, hi, I'm Wolfgang. Um, could you summarize a bit uh, the change in functionality between uh, my post cactus and uh, your heap right? Uh, for example, in your example, I saw that now it's load, you have to load individual vector components instead of a whole vector, mm -hmm. stuff like that. So, not all the code modernization, uh, more on the low level, but functionality is uh, new and what is uh, removed. Also in terms of command line tools like this, uh, for example, sim video as gun I've seen, uh, or other tools like uh, synchronizing uh, simulation directories based on mm -hmm. variable types and so on. Yeah, so this is a difficult question to answer uh, because it, it, I think it's difficult to uh, to draw the to describe what's the relationship between uh, Qubit and Postcalculus and, post and for first, I, I try to stress that it's not your entire PyCalculus that Qubit wants to, 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 to have the same functionalities as, but it's only one of your modules, which is PostCalculus. So it's only the library for doing stuff. Uh, so there's nothing for like synchronizing, uh, uh, synchronizing uh, simulation data. Uh, for SimVideo, I have another package which is uh, similar to SimVideo in many ways, but it has again a completely different code. And as for features, there are some features and there are uh, some other features are missing. Uh, I mean, it will be uh, somehow a technical discussion of what features are there and what are not. And uh, I don't know exactly what to say. I think the big modules that are missing at this point are working with power files and working with timers. And um, as for front facing features, uh, many change the name. But they're they are they were already there with post cactus. Uh, but yes, for example, working with vectors uh, is not there. And uh, what else? Uh, yeah. For example, uh, symmetries. Like if I want to uh, mm -hmm. combine yeah. a set symmetric thing into a full three D thing again. Yeah, that's not there yet. I. You, I try to list all the features in uh, in the documentation, and there it's reasonably comprehensive. So you can have a look at that and see what's missing, what's not there. But I think what's not there, I should say, was it's not there yet, uh, in the sense that at this point, this package is perfectly usable for uh, for most simulations. Uh, and again, for example, working with vectors, yeah, it, it's nice, but I can do without. Um, so I, I think at this stage, uh, there's enough. To be useful for many people, so I am planning in the future to implement those features that we are discussing. So support for vectors or support for symmetries, especially as I start myself using needing symmetries, um, but they are not there yet. Yeah, and again, uh, all the command line tools are not there at all, and they will not be there except for like making movies. Uh, that's that's a different package, a different story, but like synchronizing or if another, like all the other tools will not be there. That's, I, I don't have plans for that. Okay, if there are no more questions, I can uh, move to the next section and I'll, I'll take more questions uh, after this. Okay, so 
uh, in the second section, I'm going to tell you about the, uh, the code itself. So I move from thinking about the project to thinking about the code. And I'm going to show you some examples and some capabilities. But uh, what I will stress is um, I will give you a, a theoretical understanding of this tool in the sense that I want you to understand some uh, uh, important aspects to make use of this tool. So, so let's start. So Qubit has uh, three gr groups of modules. Uh, the first group is what I call objects. So objects are high level representations of your data. So these are classes, Python classes, that know what they should represent. So for examples, we have time series, frequency series, uniform grid data, hierarchical grid data, which represent time series, frequency series, uh, grid data with a uniform resolution of grid data with adaptive mesh refinement. And you will see what I mean with high level representation of objects is that by in, in, a, in a nutshell, uh, these are much closer to what you think when you think about a time series as a physicist instead of like a list of numbers. There's much more to that, and we'll see that. Second, we have the what I call readers. So readers are, um, are objects that uh, bring the data, that look at your data, and depending on what you ask, they provide you with an object of the first group. So we have many readers, and the king of the readers is uh, sim sim there, simulation there, which organizes all the, the other ones and we'll see that there. So the goal, the goal of the readers is to look at your data, organize your data, clean your data, and present you with an object. Finally, we have the utilities, which already touched upon. Uh, these are functions that play well with uh, uh, the objects in Quibit. And uh, well, there are utilities, you use them for stuff like for your like scientific research. For example, you want to completely spin with a spherical harmonic for some reason, or uh, you want to work sensitivity curves. So uh, now I'm going to describe these three uh, groups. So first we start with utilities because they're the simplest to explain. So again, uh, at the moment we have mostly gravitational wave uh, related stuff. So these are functions that are just useful. They achieve a specific, typically scientific goal of computing something. Again, here I'm giving some example, which are uh, computing the, uh, the redshift, redshift from the luminosity distance. Say you are working with uh, LIGO data, they tell the, oh, the luminosity distance was uh, 100 megaparsec and you want to compute the redshift. You have that, or uh, like work with antenna pattern for, for different uh, interferometers. Um, and there's also a module for computing for uh, converting from gravitational waves to physical and vice versa. And in general, this uh, group of utilities is heavily gravitational wave uh, oriented at the moment. Uh, but of course they can, I mean, this is because they need to work with gravitational waves. What I'm developing at the moment um, is utilities for using this code, for using qubit as opposed to, to for, for implementing functions. For example, at the moment, a qubit doesn't include any uh, visualization by itself. You have to visualize how you, you want. Um, but I'm working with on simpler interfaces for visualizing stuff. Not it, that it's difficult right now, uh, but uh, at the moment, uh, visualization is not one of the main goals. It's more to, to do quantitative uh, computations. So utilities that will come in the future are visualization or, or working with uh, command line tools, or at least writing scripts. Next, we have the objects. And again, objects are high level representation of, uh, of your data. And to be high level representation of your data, what they do is they support all the mathematical operations that you can think of. So for example, here I'm considering a time series. time series. And what you can do is you can sum time series one with the sign of time series two or cubed. And of course, in doing this, Qubit will check that everything makes sense. So, and this is true for grid data, and this is true for uh, time series, this is true for frequency series. Uh, you can stop thinking about a time series like two arrays, and you can start thinking of a time series as a single object because all the safety checks are done for you. And this can be both time series, both uh, series and uh, uh, 
good data can be complex or real, and um, they can be called. So you can do something like, if you want to, to know what's the value of a time series at time 10, you can just do time series of at time 10. Internally, this is going to use splines. Um, and you can specify the uh, properties of the spline. For example, if you know that your data has a lot of discontinuities, you don't want to use splines, you want to use the nearest neighbor, neighbor evaluation, you can just configure, configure that. And this, I think it's already very nice for, for multiple reasons. One is that once you can do this, you can access all the uh, essentially Python ecosystem for working with, uh, with uh, objects that are callable. So you can, uh, you can integrate with uh, 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 SciPy methods because uh, they, they just require it to be, to be able to call something. And in general, when I think about a time series, I don't want to think about the point, the index of the point, I want to think about the time. And same with the point in a grid data. I don't want to look at the index of the, the, of, of the grid data. I want, to, uh, I want to think about, oh, this is point x, y, z, and tell and ask the code what's the value x, y, z. And these are rich objects. They have a lot of methods. For example, for cropping, picking Fourier transform, resampling, integrating, driving. This is true for both uh, grid data and uniform grid and uh, time series. Then specifically for series, there are some additional nice features. For example, series, uh, they support uh, natively plotting with Matlab, so you can do something like plt the uh, plot time series, and this will plot your value and time, which I think it's extremely nice personally, uh, very intuitive. And whereas for uh, grid data, what you have to consider about grid data is that one. We have these two levels of grid data. We have hierarchical grid data, uniform grid data. And hierarchical grid data is essentially just a collection of uniform grid data. And, and in this, these objects are well informed about where they came from from the simulation. So you can trace back what's the primal num number, what's the iteration, what's the time step, all this kind of stuff. And what you have to keep in mind is that when you work with uh, grid data and you want to visualize a hierarchical grid data, you cannot do that you have to first resample that to uniform grid data. And we'll see that in example. Uh, we'll see an example of this later. Okay, uh, finally, we have the readers and these are probably the most complex part of, uh, uh, of the complex of the three. So readers are a bunch of functions or objects that have to process your output. So they look at your output and they try to understand what's inside and they try to find what you ask. So if you want to work with uh, grid data, they find the grid data. Then they deal with reading the, the specific files. So they, they know how to read HFI files, they know how to read compress files. You know, when you ask for a var variable, they know what column to look for the variable if it's ASCII file. Then the readers clean up the data for you. Again, if you have simulation restarts and you have a time series, you don't want to have a bunch of time series, you want to have a single time series. So they, they merge the data, remove duplicates if needed. and uh, what I'm going to what I'm going to say next is will be probably confusing, but I hope the example will clarify this. But it's important to understand so that you don't get lost when you use this code. So typically, readers are nested in multiple levels. So let me let me try to explain. Uh, so the king of the readers, as I said, is Simdir. So Simdir is where you always start writing your 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 scripts or your uh, working with this code. Uh, and uh, what Simdir does is it start uh, first triage of the files in your folder. So it start understanding what files are interesting, what files are not interesting. Then depending on what you ask, uh, these files will be filtered essentially. So if you want to work only with grid function, you ask grid here to, tell, to give you the grid functions. And this will uh, take you to the next level of readers, which are objects that end with the name dir. So uh, they end with the name dir because they take the data from the Simdir. And what they start doing is they, uh, they process the data only for specific groups of uh, files. For example, grid function dears only process data for grid functions. It completely ignores all the scalar data. And processing means to organize these files so that you can more easily access them. For example, uh, grid functions there organize files, organizes files depending on the dimension. So you want to work with X, Y, X, Y, X, Y, Z, this kind of stuff. Then when you specify which one of these you want to work with, you're 
uh, given are all grep functions. So readers with the name all means that they contain all the variables for a specified uh, qualifier. In this case, I'm working with grep functions, 2D, for example. It can be uh, scalar data, maximum. And all of these are like dictionary objects. So you can print them, and they will tell you what's inside. Or you can look at the keys, and it will tell you what variables are inside. A um, question regarding this, actually. So this is one of the largest problems when I get a simulation, say, from someone else. I don't know what data are there and how to access them. Mm -hmm. And of course, I know the format of the HDF5 data file. I can dig in and use keys and so on, but it is really inconvenient. Mm -hmm. So for me, it would be nice to have a nice high-level function that lists all the grid functions and for each grid functions, whether it has 3D data or 1D data and so yes. on. And uh, of course, a pointy clicky user interface is always nice if you want to just explore something. It's always very time consuming to program, so I'm not expecting that, but the high level list functions that, that gives kind of the basic ingredients of a simulation, that would be very useful to have. I don't know what you have, I'm just putting it. Yeah, yeah, so it's, if you print same there, this will tell you everything it's inside same there. So it will tell you every single grid functions that Quibit can find, every single uh, time series, every single frequency. So you can literally print same there, and it will give you a list of everything it's inside. Uh, but this, if you have a big simulation, this can take a while because it has to process a lot of files and this and everything. No, that's fine. That Jupyter Hub, it caches the output. I can scroll up. So that's good enough. Thank you. Actually, uh, that already worked with post cactus. Yes, yes. That was already there. Um, yeah, so, so then you move to the uh, next level of readers. So you have, uh, you, you specify one specific variable, and this will be the final reader, the reader that will give you an uh, object. So you right click a grid data. And uh, again, you have to be familiar with these readers just because you don't like you can only work with objects and not with readers. So let me give you an example with what I mean with all of this. So this is the first example from here on. I, have, I think I have four examples, then I the uh, presentation will be over. Um, so in this example, you want to compute the amplitude of the maximum of your density in your simulation. So this is what you should do. Well, you import same there which is the only uh, object that you need from Quibit. And then you, you define the sim there with your specific uh, directory. In this case, I'm putting dot just because. Uh, then you want to work with time series. So you, so you ask, OK, I want to work with time series. So uh, you put a dot time series. This is a first level of readers. It's a scalar there. It's a scalar there because it takes data from, uh, from a sim there. And this knows about reductions. So it knows that there's a, a maximum, minimum, or two, or whatever you have in your simulation. So then you ask, OK, I want to work with uh, the maximum. So you ask, OK, give me the maximum. And here, as you see, I switch the notation just to, to see that you can do both. I'm using the bracket notation. And this will give you uh, all scalars here. When you see uh, all scalars, all something, you know that the keys of the dictionary are the variables. So you can access this with just. Uh, with just row. And this is a time series. And as we were just saying, if you print one of this, for example, the maximum, it will tell you, OK, this is the time series I found. I found row B, M1, H, M3, and whatever. So again, this is from PostCactus. And you know, it, with this, you can do some more interactive work so that you can explore and see what it's inside the simulation. And what's happening here is, uh, is the following. First line, simder, uh, organize all the files that you have in your directory, understanding what are the important ones and what, which ones are not as important. Then uh, in the second line, uh, we only focused on the scalar data. So of all the files, Qubit found the scalar data. And then in doing this, we also found what reductions are in the data. So this is done by either, either reading, looking at the names of the, of the files or by opening the files and looking at the header. And we continue. Once we know all the, all the reductions, we can see what variables are available in the same way from the name or from the headers. And finally, when we, we, we get this row, what we do is uh, we are reading row. And in doing this, we are taking care of like finding all the files, finding all the columns, reading the specific uh, column. If they are compressed, reading compressed files. 
and if they have duplicates, remove duplicates and merging in a single in a single time series. Uh, so let's see this example. Let's finish this example. What I typically do, I put everything on a single line, and here I'm using the um, alias instead of writing time series. I write ts because it's it's more convenient, and instead of using the bracket, I'm using the attribute notation. It's the same. Just I just want to show you that you can do both. Um, and now that I read this, row is an object. So it's rich and nice to use. So what I can do is I can do some pre-processing. Uh, for example, I can crop the row because I'm interested only from time 0 to time 10. And, or I can take a window. And as a convention, what we do is methods that have an imperative name, like crop, uh, edit the object in place. Methods that are have a past tense return a new object, and for because of the way this is programmed, uh, if you have a one, you always have the other for free. So I mean, if you like, if you implement this, like if you implement the past tense, you get the imperative for free. So they they're always there both. Once you have this, you can just plot plot the Fourier transform. So here I take the Fourier transform. I take the absolute value, which is the amplitude of the, the absolute value, the amplitude of the complex uh, Fourier transform, and I just plot it. And, and this is done. I I plot. I solve the problem of plotting the Fourier transform of the maximum of the amplitude of, over time, doing some pre-processing. And the most beautiful thing here is that this code will work for your simulation too. This work, this code will work for any simulation. Of course, there are magic numbers that probably will be completely nonsense for your simulation. But uh, you can see how easy it's to you know, generalize this and then reuse your code for your simulation. So, and there's a lot of methods. There's a lot of methods that can be useful. Uh, they can, uh, derivative integration, band passing if you're working with a uh, series, cropping, smoothing, window, sampling, uh, applying a redshift. And of course, uh, you, you can do all the mathematical operation. And as we see, they work nicely with NumPy. So as a second example, uh, it's maybe similar, but I just want to, again, show you how, what is this idea of like readers. Uh, I want to compute the signal torus ratio for Lisa. So the second module I need here is uh, signal to the noise for Lisa. And in the first line, what I do is, again, I access one of the readers, in this case, the gravitational waves reader. And if you print it, you will learn that uh, the, content of this reader is indexed by the, radio, the extraction radius. So to access it, I use the bracket notation and I give a radius. Of course, you can get this radii from, from here if you want. Then this object will give you psi4, but we, what we really want to work with is, uh, is um, uh, the strain. So we, we call the method get strain. Uh, this uses the fixed frequency integration method. So we have to specify a frequency. In this case, I specify the uh, period corresponding to the frequency. But then again, I'm taking the Fourier transform and signal to noise ratio is defined, or squared at least, is defined as the inner product of this object with itself. But what we can do is we can put a noise. So here we are adding Lisa's noise. And the argument here is the same frequencies where strain F is defined because the noise can be defined on the frequencies that you want. So here I define with the same frequencies. And here, just to show you that I can, I, I specify what, uh, like the, to start the integration, because this is the inner product is an integration, uh, a minimum frequency of 20. And you, of course, you can specify the maximum frequency. Of, of course, you can specify the other if you don't need any. I think I have two more examples, then I'm, I'm done. Uh, another, example is, uh, another example is, you want to put plot contour of uh, V squared over P this ratio, and you want to do that uh, specific plane, c equals 2 uh, times 0. So once again, we have the same uh, like readers, same there, uh, grid functions there, all there, one there, and we and this is a hierarchical like grid data. We read uh, the magnetic field and the pressure. We take the ratio, and we you don't have to do anything to take the ratio. I mean, it is there. And in doing this, we we're already checking that it makes sense. Then, since we want to visualize this, 
this is a ERC grid data. We cannot visualize ERC grid data directly. We have to resample to uniform grid data. So this is how you do that. You specify what's the resolution. I, I just realized that this actually doesn't make sense because it's a 3D data, whereas here I'm specifying only two entries. These are the number of points along each direction. So it should be, there should be a third one. Uh, or I should move this up here. Okay. And um, you specify how you want to resample. So you, this is the resolution. And this is the lower corner of, of the window you want to resample. And X1 is the upper corner of the window you want to resample, where, where you want to look at. Um, and once you resample to your uniform grid data, you can slice this data, uh, or you, you could have done that before. So what it means what is, okay, here we have a slice, which means that it returns a new object. And this means, okay, keep the X dimension, keep the Y dimension and fix the Z dimension to two. So this is now 2D or 3D. And finally, we can plot. I'm not going to describe this stuff uh, because there are multiple ways to get coordinates and data depending on what your plot function wants. And since there's not much time, I'm not going to tell you what's going on. It's always uh, taking care of finding, finding files, reading, trying to combine together the MPI processes uh, if it's possible. Uh, again, being mindful of gozons. And uh, well, yeah, what I have to mention is that it was a resample through here, which means that trilinear interpolation is done to do this uh, interpolation. Uh, in practice, if you work with 3D grid data, any kind of production level 3D grid data, uh, this will be too expensive to run on most computers because it takes a lot of memory. Uh, so what you can do instead of is switch this to uh, false, which instead of doing trillion interpolation, does near, nearest neighbor interpolation. Uh, yeah, and as, a, as a final example, this is like code that I wrote for myself, really, I wanted to make a quick 3D visualization and I am using the same ideas. So I have a sim there, I have grid functions. I use again the alias, I read a time zero. I resample to uniform grid data. In this case, I also take the log. Here I'm specifying what are the boundary of my box where I want to look at the data from here. And then I plug with 3D and this is what I get. Uh, in this case, it's a disk simulation. And as you see, these are like three lines to make a reasonably simple and reasonably nice visualization in my opinion. Okay, so oh yeah, I, let me uh, uh, once again tell you that uh, like what I write for myself, I upload so that you can have a look at, and you have to go into experimental branch. And finally, I have my final slide, which is while this code is all good and nice, uh, it has to be used much, much, much more than what it is used right now, because. Uh, there are, I'm sure there are bugs, even if this code is completely tested, I'm sure there will be bugs. Uh, I'm sure it will be too slow in some places. I'm sure the interfaces will not be very nice to use in other places. So maybe something has to change in the way uh, things are presented to you. So this code has to be used a lot uh, before it can be you know, polished, uh, can be considered polished and, and done. And here I haven't discussed much at all actually. Uh, working with horizons or multiple data, but I hope I gave you a sense of what it what it is to work with uh, Qubit, so that you can look at the, the documentation and read it. And if you have questions, uh, feel free to reach me uh, this email, or I, if you, the fastest way to to get an answer from me, and probably the, the way so that I can answer your question only once is to use a, a group on Telegram to you know, users so they can answer all the ones uh, questions and not uh, via email. And I said, um, I hope, like I think this is a great tool. So I think it should be included in the Einstein toolkit officially, but this is, this is up to you. And finally, I can explain what is a Quibit in my last uh, three minutes. Uh, Quibit is this stick here. So Quibit is a Tohono word. Tohono are the indigenous population near Tucson, here in Arizona. And Quibit is this stick, which is made with the, the skeleton of the saguaro cacti, which are these cacti here. And they were used to uh, essentially displace this little fruit on top of the saguaro so that the, the people could reach them without hurting by sticking their hands on, on the thorns. So I think this package is, is, is the same. It's a tool that you can use to harvest your uh, the fruit of your cactus simulation without having to worry about the 
the, the foreigners or the low-level leakers. And I think this, uh, this is the end of my presentation. So I can take more questions. Thank you. Um, so any questions? Then I do have a question of my own and that relates to 3D output. So you already said that some of the operations will not fit onto regular uh, systems. So um, what's the biggest data that you've worked on? Say, would you think that I could work with um, data that was produced by whatever, say a thousand nodes or so, has literally a terabyte of data in a 3D checkpoint, um, but I only want to plot, say, the 3D data in the innermost whatever. Yeah. Supernova simulation. Yes, so, um, okay. Uh... What I said is very expensive is uh, not necessarily working with 3D data, but doing this uh, trilinear interpolation. So trilinear interpolation, I think, costs, uh, I don't remember, like 150 megabytes per million points. And but when you have 3D, da 3D data, uh, this very quickly approaches the limit of, uh, of how much memory you have. However, if you want to work with just one level, that's not, I, you don't have to do interpolation. It's already a uniform grid data. So, uh, it's it, it's not very expensive, and the same. If you what I did here is I didn't resample. There's no resample true by default. Resample is, is false. So this is a production level simulation. So it's a big simulation, uh, and the cost here is in the resolution I decide to output the, this this object here. The more resolution I put, of course, the more expensive it is. And when it's 3D, resolution you know quickly reaches a limit. Uh, but if you like, this is 300 points, and you see these like artifacts is not really because of uh, like uh, 300 points. It's because the disk is so big that I, the uh, cactus simulation was not, I didn't have enough resolution there. Um, so my experiments, um, the you can work with big data as long as you res either work with one specific level or resample that to, to a much smaller size. And like this, it was on my computer, I think, if I remember. Yes, it was on my computer, that laptop, which is eight years old. So maybe I can do some follow-up on, on this question. Uh, so when I developed Postcactus, uh, I ran into similar problems. So originally it was just loading the whole AMR hierarchy and then did the resampling. Uh, that was way too inefficient, in particular, if you wanted just to do, a, <clears throat> let's say a small region and, uh, forget the rest. So what I changed was to have the reader that reads in this 3D data, or the data, the HDF data, uh, resample to uniform grid on the fly uh, using only the data that would actually be needed. And this uh, sped up the loading of uh, 2D and 3D data enormously. Uh, also interpolation uh, with linear or even uh, quadratic, so second order, does not require much more memory. So I'm not sure what you are using. So in, in post so, it was this ND image. And um, so let me ask, is, is this uh, way of interpolating uh, do, on the fly still in, or is this uh, no. replaced by, you have to read everything and then you have to can interpolate? It? Correct. And yes, uh, you, you read, uh, like you, you read the fixed iteration. So when you, like if you have a petabyte of data, but you, you just read one iteration, you don't have, of course, to read the entire data set. You just read the single iteration. But you do read uh, the entire uh, uh, the entire um, data. As for the trilinear interpolation, the reason it's is expensive is because it's trilinear interpolation, which means actually it's multilinear, which means that it's not like linear along each direction. Is it takes care of all the points nearby, and uh, so uh, ND image. What it does is it looks. Uh, it, it, it is fixed, it's linear fixed direction, whereas this is linear, it looks at the, like all the points around. And the reason this can be interesting is because you can think about using grid data instead of working with 3D, working with 4D and having one, 1D that is the time. So you can do multilinear interpolation in time, including time. And this can be much more accurate uh, than just doing linear interpolation in time. But the cost is, is uh, way, way, way more expensive. But it, personally, I typically don't use interpolation at all. I just look at the nearest neighbor. Yeah, I found 
that uh, this approach of uh, not interpolating on the fly is really prohibitive if you work with real data. For example, for BNS simulations I've performed when making movies, uh, just even just the 2D cuts, uh, th this was, uh, well, it was possible to, you just had to wait a few days uh, until the movie finishes, but it was really annoying. Uh, so this on the fly method uh, it sped this up by at least a factor of 10 and also memory wise, it's, uh, I can now read uh, high resolution data on a single machine, uh, which is also necessary because the whole thing is not parallel. Uh, I mean, MPI parallel. So I, I think this uh, is, is an important design decision. So I, I've learned it the hard way. Uh, it's uh, <clears throat> So I, I would really suggest to, to consider it, uh, having an on-the-fly interpolation that is uh, yeah, so at the a really large fall, factor. At the moment, this falls into this. Like at the moment, in my like I, I, I didn't find any like I haven't I, I didn't need to do like any 3D big visualization. So I didn't find this bottleneck, uh, and this is exactly because uh, I like you know my testing was limited. Uh, or at least when I had to do a 3D visualization, it was like with a hyper end horizons, which are like it's extremely cheap to plot. Uh, but in case this will be like, if this is a problem, it will be addressed uh, once this is established to be a problem and benchmarked. Thanks for, for your comment though. Okay, so um, let me see. So this was really interesting just in case. Um, so we had one more question by Eric. Let's see if he wants to quickly ask that and then if we can go back to this discussion maybe um, just to make sure that he isn't cut off completely. Thank you. I, I might have multiple questions, but they, they should be smaller. The first question is, can you access remote data? That no. is, I work on my laptop and uh, it accesses data from, you shook your head, I guess that's an old then. Mm. Yeah, I don't, but you can install this in your cluster. Yes, and then use JupyterHub remotely, I guess, but yes. So in addition, I mean, it was brought up earlier that uh, we're working on a carpet X, which has a different file format. Mm -hmm. In addition, I have also experimented with the newer, possibly more efficient file formats for carpet itself. And if the tool is useful, I'll be interested in having that supported. Mm -hmm. The basic layout of the files is very similar. It's HDR5 based. There are Fortran arrays of data stored in there, but the metadata are different. So I guess it would be straightforward to implement that. Uh, you have some if condition and you check what things are present in HDR5 to read that. Yeah, the, there's already some uh, infrastructure for that because uh, for example, uh, you you can output bosons in your HDR5 files or you can decide not to output bosons and there's a flag in carpet for, for I want to output bosons or not. And uh, it's important to know if uh, bosons are in the data or not. So uh, Quibit already reads the metadata and dispatches in a different way, depending if you have cousins or you don't have cousins. Okay. Also, the Carpet X format is based on the Silo library. Silo mm -hmm. is, as I understand, the standard format for Visit, which is why I used it. And it's HDFA based as well, but you might use Silo bindings. I don't know whether there are Python Silo bindings. Okay. Next question. Is there support to arbitrary data at arbitrary points, to interpolate data at arbitrary points? Yes. You mentioned yes. earlier this, this linear interpolation, but here it would be something like, for example, finding horizons in post-processing or something. Yes, yes, yes. yes. You can, uh, like, uh, what I did here, uh, where is it? Here, what I did was, like, this number 10, it can be on the data, like, it can be part, one of your data points, and it can be maybe not one of your data points. So what you can do is you can uh, always call, like, X, Y, Z, and you get mm -hmm. that is like X, Y, Z. And you can do this with arrays. So you don't have to specify one point, you, you specify a list of points, you will be returned the list of points. So what you can do, if you want to work with horizons, uh, you, you prepare the coordinates that you, where you want to look at. So you define your X, Y, Z, X, Y, Z, and then you feed them, and this will give you the points. Mm -hmm. Another question, is the support to perform arbitrary arithmetic operations on grid functions? So here's an example. I output the while tensor and later people want to calculate invariance. So you have the while tensor, you might need to take derivatives that is supported yes. and then polynomial expressions on these to calculate yes. i and j and so on. Yes, yes. Okay. as you see so here, good. what I'm doing is I'm 
for, for the example of time series, when I'm doing, I'm, I'm taking like, I'm summing to a time series, I'm taking a cube. So uh, if you want to uh, wrap this in a nicer polynomial expansion. Uh, oh, yeah, sorry. I, I, I assumed that was only possible for time series, but if no, it's no, worked, no, it's for, the title says yeah. it works for all objects. Apologies. Yeah, so, okay. so the infrastructure for doing all this stuff, there is a, like technically, what happens is that there's a super class called uh, based on Miracle that implements all this stuff. And then time series and grid data are to concrete, well, concrete uh, representation of that single abstract class. So everything that it's uh, in time series, or almost everything that's time series is also for grid data. Okay, because my last there, question. Mm -hmm. Is there support to integrate over the domain or to have reductions, say some reduction? Uh, yes, I think so. I don't remember actually. Uh, I'm sure for time series, uh, I have to check for, uh, for let me probably can check here quickly. Uh, or somewhere. Well, data. well, if you don't recall at the moment, then it's probably straightforward to implement if someone has a, has a need for that. Okay. Yeah, there's a uh, integral. So, so at yeah. least it was in past cactus. If you copied that, it should still be there. Yeah. Or okay. re-implemented it. Sorry. Yeah. It's a, there's a, a there's an integral. And there's also the different norms. For example, you can compute. I don't know if you can still see my window. You can compute. Uh, yes, norm, yes. I see norms. Norm two and norm okay. p. You can compute norm p even. Uh, okay. And finally, I have uh, two suggestions. One is to publish a paper. Yeah, it's already. Did you do being, it already? It's it's. Uh, I submitted it to the journal Open Science Software or Open Source Software. Just okay. Uh, and the other thing is, you could put the code on Conda Forge. Uh, in, in some cases, Conda makes it easier to install things than just using pip. I'm not too familiar. Maybe it's just a trivial thing. Maybe it's not necessary. But uh, yeah, it makes it easier to up, update something. Anyway, that was just a suggestion. That, uh, I'm done now with my question. Thanks for humoring me. With that, um, I think I would like to thank Gabriel very, very much for a very interesting talk. Um, uh, and everybody who's involved and gave inspiration for postcard tools and Quibit, um, which seem to be really useful tools. And with that, thank you very much. And I guess I'll see you all next week again.